Hello, Blue Jays fans. Welcome to episode 235 of the Jays from the Couch radio podcast. We've got a great episode for you coming to you live via our YouTube channel and our Facebook page. We've got a great episode for you, and we're so glad you could join us. I want to thank you very much for tuning in. I'm your host, as always, Sean Doyle. You can follow me on Twitter at DoyleJFTC. Before I bring in my guests, I want to take a moment to remind you that we are coming at you live, all up in your live stream. We're here. And we're happy to be doing it. We're trying something new. It's 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 in its infancy, so we're not quite sure. There may be some hiccups. You know, we're in, it's we'll call it a rebuilding project. It is what it is. Mistakes may happen. They may not happen. Either way, we're happy you're tuning in, and we appreciate it. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. I think there's a button somewhere down there that says subscribe. You've got a little bell. Click on that. You'll get notifications whenever we go live and all of that. We upload a new video. You'll get that. Good. What is it? Uh, Facebook? Anybody ever heard of that? Apparently, we're there, too. Facebook, search Jays from the Couch. We're live there as well. And apparently, with our new platform here, what you can do is you can ask questions or comments, and, and it should pop up right here on this screen and... So I'll be looking for those. Not sure how it's going to work. I don't understand it all that well, but we're going to give it a go. Anyway, regardless of all of that, just because we're trying something new, we're not getting rid of the old. The podcast is still available on Google and Apple and Spotify and Stitcher. Wherever you find a podcast, you'll find Jay's from the Couch Radio. Give us a subscribe there. You can listen on the bus, on the subway, while you're cooking dinner. Whatever. While your kids are going crazy in the background, plug us in and we'll calm you right down. Jays from the Couch Podcast, look us up. As well, we're on Facebook. I already said that. Instagram, uh, Twitter, at Jays from Couch. We're everywhere. We've got a great episode for you this week. We're going to talk about some potential ideas for MLB rule changes and how that might affect the Toronto Blue Jays. Some interesting ones, some contentious ones. Maybe even some lunacy, lunacy, lunatic, some crazy ones. We'll see. <clears throat> As well, we're going to talk about the front office of the Toronto Blue Jays. We've got Mark Shapiro up for a contract extension. Should they? Shouldn't they? Will they? Won't they? All of that. So it's going to be a great episode. And coming at you live to help me all of with all of that, we've got Jays from the Couch writer Karen Sutar. Good evening to you. Good evening, Sean. Are you excited? I, I am. We're live. <laughs> <laughs> We're live in everybody's <laughs> living room, apparently. <laughs> Hi, <laughs> <be> fans. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, welcome, Karen. Thank you for joining me. And thank you for having me. And as well, we've got our nutty neighbor to the south, Steve <laughs> Fichetti, joining us from somewhere around Pittsburgh. I don't know if it's that close to Pittsburgh, Steve, but welcome to you. Yep. Uh, thanks for having me. I'm actually just over the little little Mount Washington from downtown Pittsburgh. Okay. And this, of course, is the first mistake because you had me on, but that's but that's not a technical error. That's just a, a, a judgment error. But that's okay. I'm happy to be. Here. <laughs> I listen. My judgment has been questioned before, and and, and I, I'm still here. That's so. Uh, I'm not worried about that. Um, so yeah, we've got a, an interesting little. Um, episode for us first of all this live experience I, i'm a little nervous about it i'm gonna be honest uh you know like you're you're we're welcoming the world into our our collective spaces right so i took some time and arranged this background here and making sure that it appeared all that you know whatever karen you've got your curtains closed and steve you've got a nice little collection of cds and for for our young listeners those actually have songs on them you put them into a machine <laughs> and you and and they play songs it's amazing it's it i know steve i know you know what they are but for our young listeners i gotta you know try and explain history to them right <laughs> <It's> <laughs> Um, anyway, yeah. So here we are coming live and we've got a number of things to talk about. I thought I'd like to maybe talk, uh, start with a post uh, that Jim Scott at Jays from the Couch put up. He had an interest, some interesting ideas about potential rule changes. 
And I thought it would be good for us to talk about those rule changes and how the Blue Jays might um, fare under those changes. Because, let's be real, there was some changes that we saw in the shortened season, and you know, excuse me, you know Rob Manfred couldn't wait. He was just itching to find an excuse to mess with the game. Right. And a shortened season, well, we need shorter games. So we'll start a runner at second, like we're playing in the backyard. Now, I, rumor has it he, he tried to call it the ghost runner, but um, that was shot <laughs> down. Uh, <laughs> this is almost starting to sound like a conspiracy theory. <laughs> <laughs> to to right. any of those going around. <laughs> <laughs> the runner in white. Um, Oh gosh! <laughs> you know, yeah. So maybe he, you know, I, I, he may have thrown out the idea of using a golf ball instead of a baseball, and you know, just <laughs> really, really, you know, focus on the home run, right? It's what it what brings the fans in, even though they're not allowed in. It'll bring the cardboard cutouts in, anyway. <laughs> <laughs Rob, oh man, I can't wait till that guy's fired. I'm not going to lie to you. <laughs> <laughs> Man. Major League Baseball will be better off when he's gone, I hope. But anyway, all of that aside, the first idea that Jim has, and for those for those of you watching uh, now or listening at home, check it out at jaysfromthecouch.com. The post is called Seven Ideas, <clears throat> excuse me, Seven Ideas for a Hopefully Less Crazy 2021 Season. It's as always, Jim does an excellent job. Um, but his first idea, and uh, and Steve, I'll start with you. A hundred and fifty game season. That was his suggestion. So we're shortening the season, right? And we know that Manfred wants to keep extended uh, playoffs. And and by all accounts, I don't know anybody who doesn't like the idea. Um, but a hundred and fifty games, Steve. First of all, where are you on that idea? And how would that play out with the Blue Jays? I personally have no problem with 150 because it's more than 60, which is always a good thing. But I just don't see where the owners are going to allow to just 150 games. You know, I mean, personally, I think it would be great. I think it would really be the first test of this roster to see and judge exactly where they are. How far have they really come as opposed to the 60 game smaller sample size? So I would all be for it, but anytime it's going to cost owners money, I'm skeptical and I just don't know. Of course, with COVID, it might be a moot point anyway, because if you can't have people in the, in the stands, like you know, here in Pittsburgh, I mean, they allowed 5,700 people into a NFL game in a stadium that seats, I think, 61 or 62. You know, so the owners, if they can make it up with streaming revenues or on the other end, I guess they would be okay with 150. But um, I don't know. I'm not really sure. Yeah, and and Karen, how about yourself? Where are you on a 150 game season? Right. Um. So I, I did read Jim's article, and, and as you said, I thought he did a really good job, as he always does. But my understanding from his viewpoint is that 150 was meant with, with the idea that in all likelihood, even if there is a COVID-19 vaccine, that there still could be some COVID-19 issues. There might be some positive tests here and there as hopefully the virus starts to die off, it, it might probably won't be 100% perfect. And my understanding is that, you know, unlike this year where they, they squeezed 60 games into 66 days and it worked for 28 teams, that this would be a way of, okay, if there have to be postponements, that there are fewer games to make up and more time to do it. So in that regard, I can see the benefit of it. Um, I, I mean, they've already made a 162-game schedule, so I don't really see them turning around and scrapping that in favor of a planned 150-game schedule. Uh, I do agree with Steve that 150 is better than 60, 
<laughs> I, I've got my fingers crossed for the, the quote unquote regular 162 again. And uh, hopefully they'll be able to pull that off. I, I, I saw somewhere not that long ago, it's been 50 something days since the last positive test in any MLB organization. So that's great that, that they finally figured out how to get it under control. And uh, yeah, hopefully that can continue for everyone's sake, uh, as well as for the game. Right. And I think that was the key for me was that it seems like there was an adjustment period with regard to the how Major League Baseball teams would navigate the COVID era. And and as you said, Karen, they they point they've kind of got it that under control now. And so maybe the lessons learned from 2020 could carry forward into the next season, which would allow for a longer season, even if we're still in the same boat that we're in right now, right? Like even if nothing advances, the only issue you have will be at the beginning, which would be the spring training, right? Where you have guys going all over home, you know, and, and training and, and mixing their bubbles and, and all that stuff. Um, yeah. And then bringing them all back, right? So you would have an adjustment period, but spring training is long enough to to allow for that and a lot of guys will come early right to spring training um so maybe it is a worthwhile idea i know that uh, in the past kevin pilar has said that uh, the season should be shorter and this that and the other thing um and and with regard to revenue i wonder if ownership would actually be okay with a shorter uh season in that you guys aren't playing as much therefore maybe don't need to make as much i wonder if, i don't know if that's even plays into their thinking i mean if you're a starting pitcher you lose 12 games you may be assuming health you you maybe lose two starts so i don't know that it actually plays into that thinking but it, it's something that i think anytime an ownership group has the opportunity to cut costs and save money, they're going to do it, right? Which is why you have, in my opinion, tinfoil hat time. In my opinion, that's why starters are not being used as often, uh, as much, as long, as deep. Um, <clears throat> I think that's part of the reason to, to keep the amount of money that they make down. Um, but I don't want to get caught up in, in <laughs> conspiracies because... Yeah, we're not that kind of show. Um, <clears throat> one idea, though, that Jim had was a more balanced schedule. And, 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 and so what Jim's talking about is teams playing in their division 19 times in a regular season, obviously not, not in a COVID-induced season. Um, but he's wondering, maybe we cut that down to 10 um, three, so three series, right? Um, and then that would be, I mean, if you're looking at the Toronto Blue Jays, that means you would play teams like the Tampa Bay Rays and the New York Yankees and the Boston Red Sox, who even though were terrible this year, they're not going to be terrible forever. Um, unlike the Baltimore Orioles, who you know, <laughs> are oddly, I, I, maybe we could get like sub in the Rays games for the Orioles games and play <laughs> 20 times and never play the Rays at all. <laughs> I, I think Zach Britton's still out in the bullpen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, man, they're they're a hot mess. Um, <laughs> but Karen, I guess I'll start with you with regard to the the fewer games played within the division where are you on this i mean it does make sense on the one hand you know from a blue jays perspective um but can you really say you win the division if you're not playing that much within the division um <laughs> I, I mean how how much do i like this idea on a scale of one to ten oh about a 25 <laughs> i i've been wanting something along these lines for a very long time, I mean, for years and years, for, for that 22-year playoff drought, I, I said that in many cases, the Blue Jays' biggest problem was geography. Being in a division with the New York Yankees and the Boston Red Sox, that's bad enough if 
the the main way to get into the playoffs is by winning to the division to try to have a better record than those teams and then having to play them like 19 times a year each it's just it's just not fair whereas you know for example the Oakland A's who won the AL West this year they were the only plus 500 team in their division so to to me i think it's much better if you want to if you play the regular season and then the playoffs to to determine who is the best team in baseball in that particular year it makes so much sense if you can at least balance out the schedule more not not be constantly playing the same one or two teams and, and play a lot more of the other teams and uh, on a personal note, uh, another thing that Jim said, so if you're, if you're only playing your division rivals 10 times a season, then that also means that you're playing more of the other teams. And, and like at the way it is now, the AL East might play the NL East one year and then the NL West the next year and so forth. You, you'd be playing a lot more of those teams out of necessity. Well, I'm trying to get to all 30 ball parks and see the, the Jays play at least one game. So that would definitely help me on a personal level. <laughs> so I love it. <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. Steve, I have a crazy idea, but I want to throw it to you first with uh, this interdivisional. Uh, the, the thing is, it was set up to be a rivalry thing, right? But when you have, when you're t- talking about the Toronto Blue Jays, the, for the forever, their 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 rival was the Detroit Tigers, and <laughs> now that's completely gone away, right? So really, what they mean is they were focused on the 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 big market rivalries with you know New York and Boston. But where are you within this uh, in on this interdivisional play? I believe I love divisional rivalries. And maybe it goes back to me being such a big hockey fan. You know, I, I, there's there's something special, you know, when the Canadians play the Bruins or the Penguins play the Flyers and the Rangers play the Islanders and the Devils and you have all those different things. And I would have no problem with them scaling back, maybe playing each team 14 or 16 times. But I think 10 is too few. And from a Blue Jay perspective – if you're playing tougher teams on a more regular basis, you are less likely to be intimidated when you come playoff time, if you make the playoffs, because you've already been basically playing playoff games the entire summer. So can they be reduced? Sure. Would it be great if Toronto played Detroit a lot often? Absolutely. I, I would even say Cleveland. Play Cleveland more often, you know. You know, and I've even seen w- when the next expansion comes along, where there's going to be a division where all the Great Lakes teams will be together. So you'd have Toronto, Cleveland, Detroit, Milwaukee, Minnesota. That they're talking about doing radical, you, you know, what I, what I think would be awesome. But in the meantime, I think there's a reason that the Marlins, the two times prior to this year, went in as a wild card that they won the World Series both times because they were playing in a killer division with the Braves. The Mets sometimes got out of their own way and weren't that bad. The Phillies were okay. you know. So I think that really helped them when they got into the playoffs both times because they really had to fight and claw just to get that wild card spot. So I think for, especially for a young Blue Jay team, I think it would be terrific to keep playing in the toughest division in baseball. Right, right. That's an interesting, hmm, I never thought of it that way, but my crazy idea revolves around win-loss record. First of all, we know that the National League eventually will uh, be switching to the DH. It's just a matter of time. So really, at that point, there's no difference between the two leagues. So you have 30 teams, you take Top 15, separate those into three divisions. You take the bottom 15, separate those into three divisions, and then play it out that way. The reason I'm thinking that is, A, you have all of the so-called competitive teams playing each other, and then you have all of the non-competitive teams 
playing each other. It's more balanced baseball, first of all. But <clears throat> then you don't have a situation where, like the uh, the Minnesota Twins, can run away with a division um, in in the Central, and the entire rest of the division is you know mediocre. Um, and then you have a division like the American League East, where year to year it's a, at least a three team race. Um, so to me that it almost, if you want to talk about parody across baseball, maybe this is a way to kind of, to do that. Right. The only problem is, is that you have to look at how you structure your postseason, right? Because if you have only what 16 teams making it, that means one team, potentially one team from that, that, that second tier, um, could, pro, pro, uh, qualify for the postseason potentially unless you do it just maybe win loss record doesn't you don't run into that problem maybe right because if you have if toronto is in that upper division which this year they would have qualified for Mm -hmm. if they're in that upper division they're still playing tough teams all the time maybe their record isn't going to be as good as a Pittsburgh Pirates team who's playing in that bottom division against like teams with similar uh, rosters and similar skills, I guess. Um, I don't know if that would work. I just thought of it just now. So clearly <laughs> there's some homework required. Um, but I think it, it, it might you know, off the top of my head, it might provide some incentive for teams to try um, and push for the postseason, but it also might provide teams some incentive to try and not push for the postseason so that they end up in that bottom tier, right? Um, so that's my only kind of... Anyway, I'm just thinking out loud at this point. I guess, Karen, Karen, because you're the nicest of the three of us, I'm going to ask you... Oh <laughs> Am I crazy here? Like, is this, could that work? Um, I, I'm not really sure. I mean, so they would, that they would qualify for the postseason because of win loss record or, or some other criteria. Yeah. So you would, you would look at win loss record just like you would now, right? So a Pittsburgh Pirates team, for example, if we look at them in 2020, they would be in the bottom half. Right. Maybe they and because they're playing more often, they're playing teams in that bottom half. Their record would end up being better than where it would be if it was all mixed. So maybe they would make the postseason. And and my question is, is that fair? If you want what whatever number of teams, (laughs) whatever number of teams are going to be in the playoffs. So pre 2020, they were up to. 10 out of 30, which I've always thought was too few, um, or they, this year it was 16, and, and what I've heard Manfred has said that they'd like to continue the expanded playoffs, but not with as many as 16, so I assume that means either 12 or 14, and if that's the case, if you're going with 14, don't you want to try for that to be the best 14 out of 30. I, I mean, if you've got, if you've got the days in, in, in that, the higher tier, so to speak, and they lose more games because they're up against stiffer competition. And then a team, you know, whatever team it is that's in the lower tier, they win more because their competition isn't as tough. How is that really fair? And, and you can say that about any team any team, if that happened to them, I, I'm not sure about this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, and and again, I, I I'm not suggesting it's something they should do. It's just it occurred to me while we were talking. But Steve, before we go, like before we move on, Steve, am I crazy here with this idea? You are a genius. Oh, okay. I mean, I, I would. I've always hold on. Been a, time out. Uh, time out. I'm okay. going to go find my wife so you can say that. <laughs> well, well, she can listen to the podcast. The she can play it back. You know. You know, on Facebook Live or YouTube. But no, I mean, I think that is terrific. You'll get pushback from some of the larger market teams because potentially they would miss out on the playoffs because a team 
and I can have having watched them every day for 40 years, the Pirates aren't going to make the playoffs. If you put them in the International League, they're not going to make the playoffs, right? <laughs> so don't worry about that. But I, I digress. Um, I'd even I would been a big advocate of having the two leagues and having two different sets of playoffs. And in essence, the teams that make the championship of the lower divisions would go up and the team with the two worst records would come down similar to like they do in football. I'm not going to say the word soccer because that's going to immediately turn off every American because they, you know, if it's soccer, oh, okay, anything that's like soccer, we can't have it. But uh, I, I think that's a terrific idea. And it, but it would generate interest in some of, of the smaller market teams that are struggling to try to compete because then if they do well in that lower division, they're still going to make the playoffs. They're going to get playoff revenue. The fan base is going to get a little bit more excited. And it may not last, but it, it's a year or two where I think it's a, it's a terrific idea. So, of mm -hmm. course, Manford won't do it because it's a great well. idea. Well, and that's fine because we may not be able to do any more podcasts because I'll be moving into Rob Manfred's office. So, um, <laughs> you know, yeah. I mean, screw him, whatever. Um, the one other thing that I think I want to talk about before we spend too much time on on, on Jim's post, because, you know, everybody can read it at jaysfromthecouch.com. It's a great piece, and I'm not just saying that because it's at Jays from the Couch, and I founded Jays from the Couch, and I want you to go to Jays from the Couch. Did I mention Jays from the Couch? Um, <laughs> but <clears throat> another idea is this idea of robot umpires, and Jim, Jim has an interesting take on it. Um, the not necessarily strictly robot umpires, but robot assist. There's a robot assistant, I guess. Um, so the device scans every pitch, um, but the the result only goes to the the umpire, uh, who will have um, an earpiece that says, you know, a beep for strike or a ball. It, it stays silent, um, and then the umpire can make the call. Um, and, you know, essentially what it is, is it kind of gives the umpire a hint about whether it's a ball or a strike. <laughs> um, and, and, and I'm not sure that that necessarily is the way to go. Um, but having a ball or a strike assistant, um, whether it be, I don't know, how that would work, whether there's a green light or a red light or, or whatever have you. Um, but what I see as a problem here, um, Karen, before I throw it to you, the, the, what I see as a problem is the, so what? So if I call, or let's, let's be more realistic, somebody like Angel Hernandez calls a ball or a strike, what happens then? Because, you know, if it's not a strike. Or, or they decide that, you know, Max Scherzer's pitching, so everything he pitches is a strike, which absolutely drives me crazy when they do that. Um, but then what? You know, so if I'm the manager, what do I get? Do I get to challenge a ball and a strike? Because right now you can get tossed for doing that. So at, at what point do we say, I guess, yeah, I guess my question is, how does that play out, Karen? So first of all, I guess there's kind of a two-parter question for you is, where are you on this whole robotic um, implementation? And how do you see that playing out? Right. Okay. So but part A is, it's something that I've been wanting for a long time. I, I've seen a lot of games, but like one or two really stand out in memory where I'm sure that things were not called correctly and it influenced the outcome of the game. And some people are will argue, oh no, it's terrible. Having the human element of umpires is part of the game. I... I <laughs> very strongly disagree with that, that the human element <clears throat> should be players on one team versus players on another team. And, 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 and umpires' bad calls, whether unintentional or intentional, should not play any part in that whatsoever. Um, Jim's way of implementing it 
is interesting. And I, I think I made the point to him, whether it was in the chat or, or whatever, that <clears throat> I wonder if it's, if it's basically an optional thing. So I, I think what he said was that there'd be an earpiece and the umpire would hear a beep if it's a strike and nothing if it's not a strike. So ba basically it's up to the umpire to, you know, you use what is essentially a recommendation um, or completely ignore it. And, and I, I kind of feel like it's being rendered moot if that's the way you're implementing it. I mean, you're, you're not costing any umpires their jobs. And for fans, the game looks exactly the way as it always looked. So maybe that's what he's trying to get at there. But I, I can just see certain umpires who really come across as having egos that are larger than life completely ignoring the beeps it's like you know this is my job go away type of thing and and then it's it's just like they're not even there so i i might implement it differently if they ask me right right so steve i'm gonna throw it to you here but how do we get into the avoiding the, the you know that scene in the naked gun with when leslie nielsen has to draw <laughs> out the seventh inning right like how do we <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. It, it, no, yes. P.S. Angel Hernandez breakdancing. Yes. <laughs> well, listen. If if he starts doing that, I might consider having him. You know, being okay with him behind the plate. Um, but P.S. Did you know that Joe West was in that film? He was one of the umpires. I swear to you, it was him. I I didn't look it up. I just I, was I, I believe it. you're correct. I would have thought he'd have been better for the big fat opera singer, was it Enrico Palazzo? But <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> he, he, he is one of one of the one of the umpires, you know, in, yeah. in the Naked Gun. And, and you know what? And screw Angel Hernandez and Joe West and Adam they, West they and whatever Palazzo. other you know umpires they come up with. Just put it in, saying we have the technology now, and this is going to be your ball and strike. Okay, if it goes out, I mean, you'll be behind the plate, so you'll get your camera time. Okay, but you know, you'll be there in case for some reason the technology breaks down, and then you can make the manual call. Otherwise, it's just like you said, Karen. Joe West isn't going to listen to anything other than dinner's ready. That's the only thing he's going <laughs> to listen to if it comes through his earpiece. You know, <laughs> and Angel Hernandez, I, I don't think he would listen if you put a gun at his head. He's not going to listen. So. It's too bad, you know. If their feelings get hurt, your little feelings. Whoa, whoa, whoa! You, 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 you're demeaning us. You know what? Do a better job, and we wouldn't have to come up with this stuff. We could have spent money, you know, developing other vaccines for other diseases rather than developing technology because you can't <laughs> consistently call a ball or a strike. Okay, so yeah, so I mean, so this nice implementing type stuff, no way. Just put it in and do it and suck it up. And if you don't want to do it, do something else. If right, I and paraphrase David Price. If you don't like it, call a better game. Yes, <laughs> exactly, exactly. But I mean, it's it's. We shouldn't know umpires' names. Let's be real here. You know, we the, we shouldn't know them. And and anybody, the fact that we were just able to name. And here's the other: th Can you name good umpires? I cannot, off the top of my head, name an umpire who I said, "Okay, I like this 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 style of of umpiring." I I can't name one. Frank Drebin, okay. but again, that's a movie, though. So yeah, so, so <laughs> yes, that, that's he, he, he's the can. best. <laughs> He's the best. He's the most fun. No, I mean, I'm sure there are good umpires out there. We don't know their names because they're good umpires. They allow us to focus on the game, which is what it should be. Exactly. And and that's exactly my point. Um, it, anyway, it, it, whatever is going to happen, I kn we know it's only a matter of time before Major League Baseball just says, as, as Steve just said, screw it, we're doing it. Right. And what that looks like remains to be seen. Um, we know Rob Manfred is not uh, afraid of tinkering with the most beautiful game on earth, um, <laughs> which is baseball. P.S. Sorry, the rest of the world. I know you how you feel about your football or soccer, uh, but baseball is the most beautiful game. Um, 
before we get out of here, we should probably, I want to talk about something a little bit more specific to the Toronto Blue Jays. Um, and recently, Mark Shapiro made some comments, president of the Toronto Blue Jays made some comments about his future, wanting to finish what he started and bring a championship. He said all the right things, as he always does. You know, he's very well spoken. Um, he does not say anything he doesn't mean to say. Uh, but he did say that he has a desire to return to Toronto and there seems to be a desire to have him return to Toronto with the people who make that happen. So I guess my, my, my question is, and Steve, I'll start with you. My question really is just simply should the Toronto Blue Jays bring Mark Shapiro back moving forward? I say yes. I mean, I think he has been focused on the business aspects of it rather than the baseball aspects. And he was kind of walking that line in Cleveland. And that's where he struggled. The development of the new minor league complex. He was a major role player in that. He oversaw that. If anyone is going to get either a new ballpark or renovations to Rogers done, it's going to be Mark Shapiro. Plus, P.S., now that he's a Canadian citizen, if Trump wins, he can't get back into the States for another baseball job. So just from a personal standpoint, I want to see him be able to, to, to continue what he is doing there. I, I hey, did when, not when know. When did that happen? Yeah. <laughs> Has he become an actual Canadian citizen? Uh, 2019, I believe. He, he Actually, he's an official Canadian citizen, yes. I am going to dual? look that up. I, so I he has that would be dual. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, I, I can double check for you now while you're talking to Karen about it. But sure, I'm sure. 99.99 percent sure he's a Canadian citizen. And yeah. and and I don't I don't mean to say I'm going to look it up just because I don't believe you. I, I'm going to look oh, no. it up because I never heard that. Um, which gets you know that's 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 a pretty big move, Karen. To, to you know, I'm I'm here for a few years and now I'm going to become a Canadian citizen because I love Toronto so much or. Or downtown Canada as a <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> tweet. <laughs> oh. uh, but anyway, we were way off track there. But Karen, with regard to, I mean, citizenship aside, with regard to, to Mark Shapiro, um, does he deserve to be back? And if so, like, where do we go? Like, you know, what does he have left to do other than the championship, obviously? Right. I mean, well, the championship. Yeah, I I would like to see him stick around. I, I think the job that he and Ross Atkins have done has been very good. I, I mean, I think I think we talked about this on a prior podcast that, you know, that they took over when Anthopolis left. And so many people who I talked to were saying, oh, this is going to be a disaster for the Jays, that these guys were with Cleveland for the longest time, and Cleveland never stand, spends any money on payroll, and it's like they're they're putting it on Shapiro and Atkins that they never spent money. But I think that's got to be dictated by ownership, and Toronto's ownership is completely different than Cleveland's, and I always believed and I believe we've started to see this, that when the time was right, when it made sense in terms of the competitive cycle, that they would be willing and able to spend. They spent $80 million on Ryu. And and, and as we were saying a while ago, a, a comment that I think I made, that, that they've never come out and said, okay, this is our direction. And then they do something completely different. So when Ross Atkins says, this offseason, we're prepared to add an impact player, possibly a super impact player. Like, I, I, I would be shocked if they did next to nothing. I, I'm expecting some interesting things to happen. I, mm -hmm. I expect the team to continue to improve. I would be very surprised if we don't see a championship, you know, sometime this decade, possibly more than one. And, and it would be great if the architects of that were around to finish what they started and, and enjoy it and get the accolades that they deserve. Agreed. And then the other, like, I think when we think about, and you know, being around for what they started, we're now at the point where whatever Alex Anthopoulos has started, very little is left of that, right? Like, you know, like Vlad 
really is mm-hmm. is is about it right so <clears throat> they ha- what they've done is they've taken a team that Alex Anthopoulos um splurged in one summer to empty you know um and and it was worth it I mean, I am not going to knock that. I've got my bat flip picture right behind me here. I can't point on the camera, but it's there. Um, I'm not going to knock that at all. But the impact of it was, you know, it was obvious on the farm system, right? But in here we are in 2020. Now the Blue Jays made the postseason. Yes, expanded playoffs, blah, blah, blah. But they've turned the ship around in really three, three years. Right. That to me. And not only have they turned the major league ship around, but their system is back to being one of the best in baseball. That is not a small feat. And I don't think that people get enough credit for that, um, given, you know, the the, the baseball is, much, is, is very much a what have you done for me lately? And, and we haven't, you know, blah, 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 all of that. Right. Mm-hmm. And people are having a hard time getting over the departure of Jose Bautista and Josh Donaldson and Edwin Encarnacion and Marco Estrada and so on and so on and so on and so on. Um, but just for the way they've gone about, and, and Steve mentioned the, the, the renovations in Dunedin, they've done a lot in those three years that I think they don't necessarily get enough credit for. Cause what people focus on is the Ryu deals and, and whatnots. And, and just because you can spend money doesn't mean you should. And they've exercised some really good restraint. They've exercised some intelligence in making the moves that they have made. And, and you know, really the only dumb move that I can pinpoint right off the top of my head was the Kendris Morales signing. Um, I thought that was probably the worst thing they've done. However, in that moment, you were getting somebody who was supposed to replace Edwin Encarnacion, who you tried to get, right? Let's be clear. They tried to get him. Mm -hmm. He said no. And they said, okay, well, what's the next best thing to that? And in that moment, Kendris Morales was it. So, you know, it it was terrible (laughs) as... As time went on, it got worse and worse. But in that moment, I can't blame them. I probably would have done the same thing myself. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that Mark Shapiro has, you know, has steered this ship. And I think Ross Atkins deserves a lot of credit. And, and Andrew Tanish and, and the entire front office deserves a lot of credit for this. But when we're looking at does Mark Shapiro deserve that extension? Should he be back? The hell yes, he does. And I don't care what it costs. Uh, you know, pay that man if you ask me and, and pay Ross Atkins, if you ask me and, and, and (laughs) which leads me to, you knew we were going to do it at some point. This conversation is going to have to be about the manager, right? (laughs) (laughs) Can can I, before we start uh, down that rabbit hole, can can I circle back just a tiny bit to Kendra's Morales? For sure. For sure. It it most definitely did end up, not being a good signing for them. However, I thought that on paper, it looked like a decent move. But when you look at his stats up until that point, I mean, his his 2016 was a pretty darn good season. And he played in Kansas City, which is much more of a pitcher's park than a hitter's park. So that there was reason to believe that he would likely do really well Play, playing for the Blue Jays and the Rogers Center, and it's it's just unfortunate that his decline wasn't so much gradual as it was a fairly steep fall off a cliff. So yeah. <laughs> too yeah. bad that one didn't pan out. However, <laughs> no, but they don't all pan out, right? No. That's the you know that the, and it happens in baseball, and and not everybody can be the Eric Neander there in, in Tampa Bay, where everything he touches turns to gold, and every move he makes turns into Randy Arozarena. Like it Man. just doesn't, you know. Like, <laughs> I don't know how. Anyway, that's a whole other story, and 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 just so that we're clear, we're not going to go down the the Charlie Montoyo rabbit hole. Correct. This week. but that question will have to be answered right and that's a little bit more of a a tough one to answer if you consider uh, when compared to the president and the general manager um i do just want to jump in real quick on that 
I think that Atkins and Montoya decision really need to be made at the same time, but they should not be made now. Shapiro should be resigned. I will argue that the minor league turnaround was in large part Ben Sherrington. Yeah. Not necessarily. And that's not that Ross Atkins just said here, Ben, you take care of the minor leagues and I'll take care of the major leagues. It's not, it wasn't the case, but Ben Sherrington's fingerprints are over every level of the blue Jay system. And it, I would be curious to see, I think he had a decent draft. He did a nice job with the international free agents. What does he do in the neck with the next draft class? And then, okay, you know, if he has a good draft, everybody acknowledges great that he makes some great acquisitions in the off season and during the year. Okay. Then you extend him. And then I think if Charlie proves that, um, you know, he can manage based on what the front office is asking him to do. I think that earns him an extension as well. That would be an interesting scenario. Um, but before we go here, Steve, I just wondered, did, were you able to find Shapiro? Yes. He became a Canadian citizen in 2019. Well, then. Well, then. There you go. Yeah, now, I love now, you. Right. My guess is, and having been someone – of dual citizenship type of background, he probably still re he does not renounce yeah. his American citizenship, so it might be easier under a non moronic president to get back in the country and work. But you know, I, I merely brought that up as he's he's got to be he may be the main Canadian watching even more than Trudeau and the and the federal government. He's watching this. U.S. presidential election saying, please, God, if I ever get fired, I want to be able to go back home. <laughs> well, you know what? Depending on how that election goes, there may be a whole lot more Canadian citizens coming. So. <laughs> a lot of us are saying, please, God. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Okay, we are out of time here. But before we go, I want to thank you both uh, so much for joining me on this on this uh, new adventure, newish adventure. But uh, before we go, uh, let everybody know how they can follow you, uh, Karen, um, on Twitter and all that stuff. Right, yes, I'm on Twitter at uh, Karen Sutar One. That's S O U T A R One, and I'm on there uh, pretty often, and and love to chat about baseball or or various other things. Uh, mutual respect is important, and uh, yeah, that's me. Awesome, thank you so much, Karen, for joining me tonight. Thank you, Sean. And Steve, let everybody know how they can follow you. Okay, well, you can follow me on Twitter at. Feckless tweets. Uh, you can find that information also under my biography at jaysfromthecouch.com. Um, please look this week for various links for something called the PPJ Rockathon. They raise money every year to benefit the Early Learning Institute of Pittsburgh. With the pandemic, with the limitations on schooling, these kids that need special attention and can't be reached academically through the normal channels they need our support and the money that gets raised through this fundraiser takes care of basic things like bus passes for parents to get to the centers so please when you go to at feckless tweets this week look for things for the rock found it'll be links to where you can help donate to the project there's a big uh foundation grant that's going to be announced during the course of the rockathon and um as always it's okay to hate me i understand no one does. Uh, and, and Steve, as a, on a personal note, as a, a, a teacher myself, um, I, I think that that's a, an excellent initiative that you're, you're a part of there. And uh, I will be sure to share those uh, tweets as well, either at Great. Jay's from Couch or my own at Doyle JFTC. Thank you so much for joining me tonight. Thanks for having me. All right. That brings us to another episode complete. Our live adventure streaming on Facebook and, and YouTube and all of that. So make sure you subscribe on YouTube. Get the little bell notifications on Facebook. Subscribe there. And, and you'll see all of these weekly episodes live. Our beautiful faces coming at you. And of course, don't forget, 
the audio version on Apple, Google, Stitcher, Spotify, everywhere you find a podcast, you will find Jays from the Couch. So for Karen, for Steve, for Mark Shapiro, my guy, <laughs> this is Sean Doyle, hoping life gives you a juicy fastball down the middle and you don't miss it. Take care.